Now, to help us continue our journey, I would now like to invite on stage someone who has devoted a considerable part of his professional life to thinking about the future of education. He has been described as a practical visionary. He's a prolific author and an acclaimed speaker. Please join me in welcoming Mark Prensky on stage. Good morning, buenos dias, excellency, chairperson, friends at WISE, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present these ideas to you. And I'm going to go very quickly through many ideas this morning. You don't have to take notes. If you, you want to, the information, you can get my slides by sending me an email if you have a question you can send it to me by email. We will get you the slides in English and hopefully in Spanish as well. So for me, it's all about the kids. That's really why we're doing this. But not necessarily these kids who are in our current system now. They will more or less go through the current system because it is slow to change. I'm more interested in these type of kids, the kids who are not in school yet, who are yet unborn. And the question that I want to ask is how much will his world have changed in 20 years? Because that's when he's going to be or she's going to be at work. And our kids need to get to the future, not just equipped for the world of yesterday, where we grew up, or even for the world of today, but equipped with the skills and experiences that will empower them to function and thrive in a very different context of the third millennium. They need our help to become the people they want and need to be, and not just the people that we want them to be. And there's too much of that that goes on in education. So the question is, how do we best prepare kids for the future? How do we prepare them to thrive in a very new and different world and context? And especially, how do we unleash the power of these 21st century kids? Because they are now much more powerful. And in order to do that, I think we have to reimagine education all the way from the pre-kindergarten years all the way through grad school and beyond into work with a vision of a new and different and better education that better fits these kids of tomorrow and that unleashes their new power. So what I want to do this morning is give you a look at that new vision of what education will become because I think it's already with us in various places. But to see it, we're going to need some new perspectives. And that's what I intend to share with you. First, a new perspective on the world. However much you think the world is changing, it's changing faster. It's changing more. We really don't understand fully how much it's changing. Hello. But the slides, however, are not changing. <laughs> but they will. This is a graph of, of human population over time. As you can see, it was very, very low and very stable for a long time, and suddenly it's taken off exponentially. And that's the same curve for technology, and that's the same curve for innovation. And we live in that period. Whether it ever levels off or not doesn't matter, because that's where we are. The world is evolving incredibly rapidly with all these new technologies coming together. And you don't have to read these, but you can read them later. With increased volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, we call this in English VUCA. It could be VICA in Spanish. And as we heard, with this accelerating pace of change, with the emphasis not on the change, but on the accelerating pace. And what that means is we'll be preparing our kids for a very different world. 
and even more importantly, we'll be preparing different kids. And we can talk all we want about whether digital natives exist or don't exist, but we have to think about our kids in a, this new way. The technology is giving them, most of them today, but soon all of them, incredible new capabilities, and they are no longer the same people that we were when we went to school. They are far more empowered than in the past. They're quickly becoming people with what I call extended brains. Once they have that little supercomputer in their pocket, their brains are incredibly extended. And even more importantly, those brains... Is there another clicker in the house? Are all... networked together. Thank you. So the kids can do infinitely more. They can collaborate in totally new ways. They're already empowered to do all these kinds of things that you can see on the screen in new and better ways. And I'm going to give you just some examples now. And when I give examples, they're not of places, but they're of kids, what people are doing. Some of you may have heard of the software called iWire. It's a game to map the connectome of the brain. That's something that we haven't done yet. Well, elementary school kids, primary school kids can use this software and are using this software to actually do science and help map the connectome of the brain. 12-year-old girls are in schools where they have 3D printers downloading, which is very easy to do, the software to make prosthetic hands. But even more importantly, they're using their social media skills to go out and find the kids who need hands and then custom print hands for those kids. And kids all over the world are making apps. And probably every class has at least one kid who can program an app because it's so easy and the instructions are all on the internet. So here are three. One, a family in the United States was abused by the police. The police arrived late at night, it was a big mistake, but the police put them through the computer anyway. And the kids, three teenagers, said, we don't like this, we're gonna create an app to rate police encounters, kind of like Yelp for the police. And they said, and then in the cloud, we can compare different cities and different police forces, and that exists, it's called 5.0. We have a problem with bullying in a lot of places. Kids were having trouble finding a seat at a lunch table where they weren't bullied. A 16-year-old girl wrote an app that said you can reserve a place at a non-bullying table, just like we do for restaurants. That's called Sit With Us. And my favorite is an app for people where they have problems with domestic violence that just sits at home, it doesn't look like it's even on, but it's listening like Alexa is listening. And when it hears sounds, specific sounds of domestic violence, it calls the police. So this is what our kids are able to do, and that is just the beginning. And we need our education to take much, much better advantage of this. Our kids very much are disrespected, are underappreciated, and are underestimated. And how do I know this? Because they tell me all over the world that this is true. So when we look out at these classes of kids, what we really want to say is, yes, there are people that we have to consider as individuals, but they are also extended brains all networked together. And that's what we have to see increasingly. So how do we prepare these newly empowered kids to thrive with their new capabilities in this new and different world? How do we unleash their power? Let's think about education in a new way. Not just what can we add on to the old education incrementally, but a new vision of a new and different and better education that better fits these kids of tomorrow. And that education is already emerging in the world. But there's a huge wall. And there's a wall between our current education and this new and better education. And some of the kids have moved over and many people are trying to straddle that wall very uncomfortably. 
And we throw lots of darts against that wall, whether they're 21st century skills or social emotional or standards or other things. But we don't get through. The only thing that's going to get us through that wall are new perspectives. So I'm going to share with you now new perspectives on the ends, the means, the curriculum, the teaching, and the technology in education. Starting with the ends, because that's the most important thing. I believe the ends of education are changing. And they're changing from earning grades in subjects to improving our world. And that's the hugest change that we all need to see in education. But we don't, we're not there yet. We continue to ask our kids for academic achievement, success in the current system, knowledge of subject, college readiness. But in the future, we'll be asking our kids to make their world a better place. And they're already doing this. They can already help their communities and the less fortunate and many other things. They're already doing it. And what's interesting is that they want to do much more of it. That's the kind of education that they want to have. You've probably heard, like I've heard kids all over the world saying, we want to change the world. Well, when I hear that, I say, be careful. Hitler changed the world. You want to improve the world. It's very important that you think in a positive sense about what you're doing. And many groups and individuals are now starting to think in this way. Wise is one among them. The International Baccalaureate on its website says we want to create a better world through education. Ashoka, a wonderful group, says they want young people who can change the world for the better. Michael Fullen, the big consultant from Canada, is talking about education's emerging role as developing humanity. So the ends of educating our kids are now for them to better their world and in the process become good, effective, world-improving people. That's the new perspective. Not just better students or individuals, but a better world. Not just getting good grades, but becoming good, effective, world-improving people. Now, how do we do that? What means do we have? Well, the biggest means that we've been talking about all day is learning. But I'm concerned about this. We need to focus, I think, our kids less on learning and more on accomplishing. And the reason for this is that learning is really not a goal. It's not the goal of education. It's a means to a goal. The means is accomplishing. The mean, the, the ends, excuse me, are accomplishing. The ends are becoming good, better, effective, world-improving people. That's it. Real-world accomplishment leading to real-world results is what is now coming into the world. And that's really terrific, because even 200 years ago, Thomas Carlyle was saying, nothing builds self-esteem and self-confidence like accomplishment. You can read that. Lots of, okay. And the best predictor of future accomplishment, which is really what we want, turns out to be past accomplishment. So it's very important to start that early. Now, we've always thought that we wanted to improve the world through education. We just heard it in the talks. We're going to hear it all day. But we did it very indirectly. We put kids together with content, hopefully producing learning, hopefully producing improved kids, improved people, mostly in an intellectual sense. And then we put this huge bet on the table. And that bet was that someday these people, these improved people, would go out and give us an improved world. And we all know the truth is some do and some don't. Now there's a much more direct way to do that. We can put kids starting from the very beginning together with real world problems that they can handle, that they care about, and the kids come up with solutions to these problems, often solutions we haven't thought of. And in the process, there's learning. And so what we get is a, an improved world now, while the kids are in school. But the more important part is what we get in the long term are empowered, world-improving people forever. People who know they can improve the world, who know how to improve the world, because they did it as their education. The change is from a focus on personal achievement, individuals, grades, rankings, personal success, to real-world accomplishment in teams and world-improving projects and real-world results. 
So the new perspective on means is from learning in advance, going to taking courses, discussions, tests, however we do it, to real world accomplishment and learning through that. From made up problems, whether it's problem based or project based learning, to real world problems and real world projects that solve real world problems. And, whoop. and when we do that, our kids become what my good friend Zoe Weil calls solutionaries, solucionarios. It's a wonderful word. Kids who will find solutions to the problems in their lives for the rest of their lives. That's great for the future kids because that's what they want to do. The interesting thing is that it's also good for their future employers. Because if you listen to Larry Page and Sergey Brin at Google and others, they want people who can get things done. And that's something that we don't do in our current education. We do a lot of thinking, but we don't get things done. So here are some more examples of kids getting things done. A sixth grader in Canada heard that the people in Africa didn't have the same clean water and said, why can't we make that happen? So he started a foundation, Ryan's Wells, to find volunteers to dig wells in Africa, and they've done thousands of wells. Nine-year-olds heard that a water park was being requested in their town. They said, well, we should design that. They did their designs, they went to the city council, they got their designs approved, and when the architects built the park, it was built with the kids' designs. In a school that needed an environmental report for the government, they used to hire a consultant. One year they said, why don't we just hire our sixth graders, our 11-year-olds, and they did the report. That report was just as good as what the consultants did, and it was accepted by the government. There's an 11-year-old is one of the world's top cryptographers. A 16-year-old walks into a restaurant, we've all seen this, and they give out little crayons to keep the little kids busy. And he asks, what do you do with the crayons when you're finished? And they said, we throw them away. He said, well, that's a waste. He started a not-for-profit to collect the crayons, to sanitize the crayons, and to ship the crayons out to people who need them. And they've done almost a million crayons. Teens are restoring historical artifacts in a town that had a history of wooden sailing ships. They are restoring the sailing ships. When schools have extra laptops and, and desktop computers, the instructions to wire those into a supercomputer are on the internet, so the kids can do that themselves. In San Diego, California, they had a real problem with water testing, so California bought some very expensive equipment, hired a lot of people to test the water. What they found was they ran out of money, so they had to fire all the people. Well, some high school kids got wind of this, and they said, we can use that equipment. They learned to use the equipment. They started testing the water, and the trouble was that the state of California wouldn't accept their data because they weren't professionals. So what did they do? They just published their data online. And everybody who needed it had it. And I, these projects are all over. I just heard last night about a project in India where the kids are changing and restoring the zoos in their community. We're collecting these into databases so that they're easy to find for people who want to do these projects. A new perspective on curriculum. We have to go beyond these subjects, math, language, science, social studies, and even what they're doing in Finland, going to topics. We have to get to the lifelong skills that all people need, which are effective thinking, but also effective action, relationships, and accomplishment. Most of us come from this thinking tradition of academia. We've already worn these robes from time to time. And that's one tradition of education. But it's not the only one, because there's a much older tradition of education, which is the accomplishment tradition. Father to son, master to apprentice, action, relationships, accomplishment. And that tradition has gone into our workplaces, while the academic tradition has gone into our schools. We have to bring them together. Because thinking, even if we extend it to critical thinking and problem solving, which we talk about, it rarely leads to success by itself. It has to be combined 
with effective action and relationships and accomplishment. So we have to put these two traditions back together into a curriculum of generalized skills that supports all kinds of real world accomplishment. Today, we have a very narrow curriculum of skills, reading, math, written communication, writing research, maybe some critical thinking. But the range our kids need is huge. It's much broader, and most of it we don't teach today. And so this is the list, and I bet you can't read that list. If some of you can, very good. But because you can't, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to go through this list very quickly, subliminally so that you can see these, and as I do, I want you to think about, is this important? Do our kids learn it today? Should they? So, here are the thinking skills. There are quite a few. This is a very important one. Here are some action skills. We talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, but they are just a few of the skills we need. Relationship skills. Should any of those skills not be part of our kids' education? We have to start our kids on their acquisition because those are lifelong skills. That's not something you do in school and it's over. You're going to be doing those for the rest of your life. But we don't have to teach them in classes the way we do it today. So the new perspective on curriculum is not traditional subjects and topics, but lifelong skills and not learning in advance in courses and then doing, but acquiring these skills as we need them for accomplishment over a lifetime. Which brings us to the new perspective on teaching, which is away from content delivery. That's what our teachers do mostly now, to coaching and empowerment of kids. And that's what our kids need in the future. They need help in applying their passion to projects that improve the world. Not just passion, but applied passion. They need our respect and trust, something they constantly say they don't get enough of, independence, and for us to believe in them. And this is my favorite teacher, Esther Wojcicki, and one of her students was James Franco, who is now a successful movie actor, and here's what he says about her. She showed me I could take my dreams as seriously as I wanted. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what our teachers should be doing. So the new perspective on teaching is from content delivery to coaching and empowerment. And finally, the new perspective on technology is from using the technology to do the same old things that we used to do and teach in new ways to using it to powerfully improve the world. If we just use technology for writing and searching and research and calculating and watching, that's important in one sense because the world is moving, but it's trivial in another sense because we could do all those things before. What's new is for making real-time connections, useful apps, complex analyses, simulations, video, robotics. That's what we couldn't do before as students. That's what we need to add. So the change in perspective on technology is from doing the same old things in new ways with technology to using the technology to help the kids improve their world. So to sum up, our kids are already starting to improve their world. We're seeing it all over. If you went up, you would see and looked at the earth from above, you wouldn't see any place 
where that's happening big place, but you would see thousands of points of life of individuals who were doing it, students, teachers. And our job is to make these kids even more powerful. And more and more kids and teachers and schools are starting to see that in order to thrive and succeed in the third millennium, our kids need a different education a real-world accomplishment-based education whose ends are to better that world and improve humanity. And it's starting to emerge in all those thousands of points of light around the globe, but we don't even have a fully agreed name for it yet. I call it education to better their world, but I bet there's going to be a better name that emerges for something that's not the old education, academic education of the past, but is this new education of the future. And now we have to convince ourselves, or convince our colleagues, convince our parents, convince our communities and our leaders that this is the way the world is going. Saint Augustine, or Saint Augustine, very well known, has a wonderful quote, in essentials unity, in all else liberty, in all things charity. And I think the unity is in the principle that the ends of education are to better our world and improve humanity. Those are the new ends of education. The liberty will come in all the ways we do that because that's very individual. People can do that each in their own way. And the charity comes in the more positive and respectful way that we're starting to see our newly empowered kids. So to find out what works best in each place, we'd better experiment. Now some of you may be familiar with this. Parents who say, don't experiment with my kid. When you hear that, you have to say this. It would be irresponsible of us not to experiment because our kids live in a never before seen context that's very different from the world in which we grew up. That is the typewriter that I used 50 years ago in college. Most kids wouldn't know what it is. And we have yet to figure out exactly how to prepare kids for the new context. So we have to experiment together and share what works. Our future kids need an education that more deeply combines the academic and the accomplishment traditions. They need an education that integrates them into helping their local communities and their global communities. They need an education that empowers them further with independence, with self-confidence, with self-knowledge, with knowledge of how to apply their own passion, and with a strong sense of how they fit into this new and future world. It empowers them to better their world. And we need to work with parents. We now need to educate families because they have to support the kids in this new world that's different from the one they grew up in. So the new education is better for our kids because it provides them with what they need, but it's better for all of us because it liberates this huge amount of potential power to improve the world and our communities. It doesn't exist fully anywhere yet, but the good news is that we can all create it and that's what we need to do because we are at the ground floor of our very, very new world to come. It's a world full of imagination, of creativity, of innovation, of entrepreneurial spirit. And I'm a huge optimist about the future of education. And the reason I'm a huge optimist is I'm a huge optimist about today's kids. And I mean all kids everywhere. So I will leave you with what I call the new ABCs of education. Accomplish in the real world. Become a good, effective, world-improving person and contribute, contribute through collaboration to making a better world. Gracias.